So we're up to Mishnah. Mishnah Zion, Mishnah 7 of chapter 2. We're still busy in the discussion of Hillel. Remember, Hillel is, uh, but this is the last one from Hillel. And then we're going to go on to Hillel's students. All right, this is, I think this is a lot of, a lot of Pukki as I mentioned to you, is actually quite, quite logical and common sense. It doesn't take, it's no uh, major revolutionary concepts often. Um, and I think a lot of um, Pukki Elvis is actually like mainstream Judaism thinking. So that's pretty cool as well. Um, all right, let's go straight into it. Um, it's a very simple Mishnah. I don't think we need to even get very caught up with it, but it has a powerful, powerful message. Okay, who are you, Omer? Now, when I would say, when it says who Haya Omer, it often means he would say often. So Hillel would say this often. What would he say? Marbe basar, marbe rima. So he's going to start off with talking about people that overindulge in certain things and whether they're good to indulge in or not good to indulge in. So I'm sure just starting off before we even get into it, you could imagine what type of things one of the greatest rabbis in all time or teachers, scholars in all time, what type of things he would tell us are good to indulge in. So he tells us if you have too much meat, Um, if you have too much meat, you will, uh, you have more worms. Now, what that means, I'll explain to you in a moment. Mar ben nechosim, you have more possessions, you have more worry. Mar ben ashim, you have more wives. Mar ben kshafim, so if you have too many wives, I'm just, I know some of you are like hiding a bunch of wives back there. Um, then, then you're going to have increased witchcraft. Um, that's that's possibly not that practical today. Although, although it does obviously have ramifications even for today's times. Mar b'shvachot. If you have too many maid servants, mar zima, it will add in promiscuity. Mar avadim. If you add in um, servants, marbe gazelle, then it will add in thievery. Okay, so that's the negative side, things you don't want to overindulge in. However, there are certain things that you should overindulge in, supposedly. Marbe Torah, marbe chayim. If you have extra in overindulging Torah, then you have more life. Marbe yeshiva. If you have more time that you sit and study, then what is that going to? Causes you to be more wise, very logical. Marbe Eitzah, if you increase in your counsel, Marbe Tfuna, your understanding will increase. Marbe Tzaka, you increase in charity. Marbe Shalom, it adds in peace. Kana Sheiv Shem Tov, if you acquired a good name, Kana La Atzmor, it lives for you, you've acquired it for yourself. Kana Lo Debrei Torah, if you acquired the words of Torah, you have acquired for yourself the world to come. All right, all good and clear. Let's 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 look into it. It's a little bit of a long one, but it's very straightforward, very simple to understand. It's very clear um, from the onset of what Hiddle is trying to teach us, that uh, the more we um, involve ourselves in, uh, in mundane, physical, pleasures or um, or or uh, um, possessions it doesn't do us good but if we do spiritual pleasures and sp spiritual goodness then it could do us good so the bar tenura who is one of the famous commentaries on um uh on the on the mishnah and they've also made a famous a wine, kosher wine company called Bartanura, right? But he comes from the commentary. Like they, they seem to like naming kosher wine com commentaries after names of, uh, of rabbis. There's Rashi wine and Rambam wine, and they have Bartanura wine. 
Okay, I think Bart Nura sounds more fancy. So what does he Rabbi, say? Rabbi. Yeah. Do you know where the Australian kosher wine Five Stones gets its name from? Where from? It's from the five stones that David put into his pouch when he went to kill Goliath. Oh, really? Yeah, that's from that's from the owner of the brewery from her mouth. What's his name? Her name. I don't know her name. They're in WA somewhere. And she's always been very fond of the Old Testament. She's not Jewish. That's why she decided to make something kosher, but she chose something from the Old Testament to name her winery and her wine. Wow, fascinating. It, it is. Oh. So, so five stones means that the product packs quite a punch. <laughs> okay. Don't mess. David's a weapon. It's the Jewish weapon. If you drink too much of that stuff, you're in trouble. All right. Or don't mess with some of that strength. Let's let's look at these ideas. First of all, so the Bartanura explains that really everything in, in this Mishnah is talking about a cycle. It's a process, a domino effect. So he talks about you start off by wanting meat. Ah, oh, you need good food. So um, you need good food that you, you can't have good food if you can't have money to pay for it. So you start finding ways to make good money. If you make good money so you can have good food, then you start saying, hold on a second, I could afford a few extra wives. I don't have to settle with the, the one wife. Let me get a few more wives. As a result of having the few extra wives, you need extra people to take care of all your kids and take care of all your wives and to help up. So you get more maidservants. When you get all those maidservants, you need to find husbands for them and uh, for them to have children. And you also end up having to supply so many more people, children, wives, Made servants, it's all great. So you've got to find fields and uh, other things to acquire. So you need good servants to take care of all your possessions. And that ends up, um, this is the, the domino effect. Now, it's not necessarily a bad plan if you're trying to look into building a good, um, what do they call it? A good portfolio. Um, it might work good, you know, there's a, the portfolio for wives and portfolio for servants and portfolio for maid servants. It sounds great or, or uh, whatever it is. But there's an opposite direction where you start off by wanting to know more Torah. So you spend more time sitting and learning. Then you're able to, you get more advice, good advice, and also able to give more advice. As a result, you're also more charitable. You bring more peace to the world. You end up providing yourself with a good name and that stays for you and You've acquired this and that love for you, Lam Haba, world to come, you acquire the world to come, you end up having eternal goodness, not just temporary goodness. While the big first chart may be good and, 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 and look good on your portfolio, but it could actually be detrimental if you're not careful. So I, I don't think that necessarily uh, what, what Hillel's trying to say over here is we shouldn't be... Uh, have money and we shouldn't uh, eat healthy, et cetera. It's just telling us to beware of these things if they're going to lead us down the wrong track, okay? Being, having money is not a bad thing as long as it doesn't lead you to further and further and further acquisitions and further need for more, uh, more pleasures. And it's all about just filling your pleasures. If you have a good reason of what you need the money for and you're giving health and, health and charity, et cetera, it could actually be very good. It'd be very good because we see over here, Marabit Staka, Marabit Shalom. So we go to give Tzedakah, or a lot of it, if you don't have lots of possessions, a lot of money to give. Okay. So I want to just more get a, a more detailed outlook into each of these categories and what they actually mean. So let's start off with over here, Marabit Basar. So what does it mean, marbe basar? So the basic understanding of marbe basar is if you eat much more meat, meat is considered like the number one food delicacy, all different types of food that exists. And I know in Australia, meat is expensive, but fish is even more. But um, meat is considered the main, uh, I suppose, delicacy. We're told that on Jewish festivals, we should also have wine and meat because the wine and meat uh, are, are pleasurable and bring joy. Now, what does it mean that you're going to bring add in worms? So the basic understanding is the more you eat unhealthily, the more weight you put on and the fatter you become. 
and when you're very big, when you it is time to get buried, so um, your body has it takes longer to decompose because a big person's body you would expect is much more to decompose. Um, so that's the one understanding of it. And what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that we're told, you know, when you go to a funeral, you remember the, uh, I, I never watched it, but I heard about it at the time. What's his name? Was it, was it um, Frat or something like that? One of these really wealthy guys that uh, he's like one of the wealthiest guys in Australia. I think it was Richard, uh, Richard Frat, is that his name? Um, at his funeral, um, which was, on 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 uh, on television and watched by millions of Australians, they saw he had this really simple basic casket because he was buried by uh, Rabbi Levi Wolf in, in Sydney. And all the people over there commented, "Oh wow, this guy's the wealthiest person, but look what he's buried with. He's buried with nothing. Just a very basic casket." Now, what they don't even know is that it's actually um, almost empty on the bottom, right? We have a very thin something that just holds the body there and it's also full of holes. Now, why do we do that? Because, and in Israel, by the way, they don't even bury you with the box. You're buried straight in a talis or, a, or in, in, in just a, a garment that is made especially tachrichim, it's known as. Tachrichim, which is just a white garment. Um, you bury it straight in your tachrichim in Israel, and over here we have to, by law, we have to use a box. So we use the simplest box, and there's actually holes in it underneath. Why do we do that? Because we want the person to decompose as, as quick as possible. Why do we want the person to decompose as quick as possible? Because um, supposedly, the longer the body exists and exists in an incomplete status, the soul does not find a complete rest. Okay, so therefore it's telling us over here, if your body is too big, literally you have put on too much weight, then it's gonna take longer for you to decompose, which is actually, so what's wrong with taking too long to decompose? It's actually a pain for the soul. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the issue with that. Now, the other, the, um, other explanation to what it means that you have um, too many worms is that actually it causes actually could cause you issues in your belly. Sometimes meat could literally be unhealthy, and therefore you should be careful with what you eat. So even though according to Judaism, uh, eating meat is sanctioned, we're allowed to eat meat. Not in that certain times of year we are encouraged, like the Yom Tov, we're actually encouraged to eat meat. Nevertheless, we should be careful with how much of it we actually eat. Um, so it's about being healthy, eating the right amounts, and, and not overdoing it. Um, by the way, I just want to say as a side point, even though I told you that in general, we try to, uh, we want the body to become decomposed as quick as possible. Um, we do know that great tzaddikim, often their bodies will not decompose at all. Because now, why do we want the, the body to become decomposed? because um, the body has been involved in the world of physicality and it's kind of the reminder of the soul of all the things that were not so great that the body that the soul did that the soul lived through um, and the soul has this connection sorry it's, Reva, how would we know that sorry how would we know they don't just they don't decompose if they're buried okay one second good question um so before I answer your question, I'm going to say that. Um, the the body the body is going to decompose because of negativity that uh, has been experienced, so to speak, by the body or happened through the body. Now, the truth is that if a person has never done anything wrong, there's no real requirement for the person to. Uh, the body to be decomposed. And that's what we're told that certain studies to speak actually just a conduit for absolute greatness and help them reach a high level and never interfered with the godly service. Those people, their bodies don't decompose. Now, back to David's question, how do we know that certain people's bodies don't decompose? 
And in answer to that question is because sometimes, unfortunately, people have to be dug up, okay? Burials, um, for whatever reason, sometimes they've dug up um, graves hundreds of years later and found the body fully intact. And the story is about numerous great tzaddikim that that has happened to. Um, and it's, it's quite rare, but it does happen. Um, and normally, after several months, the body should have already started to decompose. But sometimes it could be years later and the body is still whole. Bye. So, I <laughs> they relocated the body of the Vilna Gaon. They were redeveloping that, that cemetery during the Russian era. Um, and they gave permission for only a few graves to be moved. One of them was the Vilna Gaon, and they do say that his body had not decomposed. Yeah, there's a few examples of those type of tzedekim that uh, that type of things happen to. Um, I can't think of all of them, but um, there's, there's, there's many, many stories like that. Um, okay, let's not get too uh, caught on this point, but that's the, the, just the first point. The next point is that if you have too many possessions, you have more worry. I don't think that needs much explanation. Um, we all know that some of the wealthiest people also suffer from the most anxiety. Um, I don't know if it was true, but I, when I was a kid, there was some type of legend about the wealthiest guy in the world being uh, dying of, uh, I don't know, dying of, of fear and the hiding under his bed or something like that. You probably may, may know the story or I don't know if the story was true. Yeah, have you heard of what I'm talking about? So the idea is that when we have too much to worry, too much, we have too much to worry about. There's, there's a famous story um, that's told about a king that is uh, always unhappy and uh, he doesn't know how to be happy. So uh, his advisors tell him you should get the shirt of the poorest person in the world or the happiest man in the world. Sorry, the happiest man in the world. And he finds from person to person, goes to all these wealthy friends, none of them are happy. Eventually, he finds this extremely poor person. This person seems extremely happy. Are you happy? Yes. Okay, the king wants your shirt. And he says, what do you mean? I don't even own a shirt. So that's why I'm happy. Sometimes when you have nothing to be happy about. So obviously, I don't think that the intention is that we should uh, have own nothing and we should be poor, as I said. But it is telling us that if, we're, if, if, if all our possessions are just adding in worry and they all scattered, especially if you had possessions in all different parts of the world, that it would probably be different because it's easy to control all these things. Um, it, could, it could cause more frustration. There's a, a statement from our rabbis that says, sometimes joy and pleasure that you get from money are not, uh, don't equal up the amount of stress and worry that money itself causes. So while you're trying to get more money, it could also, obviously it's a balance and finding that worry sometimes come from not having enough um, money as well. So that could also lead to a lot of issues. Um, so it's, it's about making sure, not that we don't have money once again, but making sure that our money is not causing us to have too many worries. The next thing that we spoke about, um, Um, sorry, I'm just going to try to open the thing. Um, so, Mar Benoshim, if you have too many wives, so it says if you have too many wives, you have more witchcraft. So, there's explana two explanations brought on why this is. Why would having too many wives bring more witchcraft? So, one explanation is because if a person has wealth and they're trying to get more money, they may use witchcraft to try to seduce women in order to get more wives in the first place. I don't know if you've, if you've ever come across such a thing. I certainly haven't. But more of the more simple explanation is that um, in old days, women were more aware of different um, negative report um, and uh, evil kind of, I don't know exactly what it is. No worries, uh, Mark. But things that can do, do damage to people and therefore, when they had another wife in that marriage, they would often, um, they would often cause them harm. That's that's the basic understanding of that. That's so you know. Uh, you know. Um, the next statement we have is that if you increase your maidservant, increases promiscuity. Um, the understanding is actually the Rambam of today, the the Chumash of today, that. Um, 
when when uh, maid servants are added for no real needed purpose, um, they often would have a negative um, purpose used, and that's not the purpose why they why they there in the first place. They were there to help. They're, they're supposed to be house help. But if there's too many of them, at least two unpleasant things. The next thing that we discussed is. Um, Sorry, well, last one is the increasing servants increases thievery. I think that's quite understood. We have too many people walking around your house and you can't keep an eye on all of them. The more employees you have, if uh, you don't have good systems, they will steal from you. Not, it's not awareness. Yet. Yes. Uh, sorry, Rob, I just need to ask with Puke Abot, I, I've always thought of Puke Abot as being very contemporary, containing lessons which apply every generation now equally to thousands of years ago. Mm. Um, so I'm a bit puzzled by some of the statements we've just gone through because they seem to be very much locked in the past and it's difficult to translate that to current experience. And I'm trying to work out whether they were meant literally when they were written or where, whether they're all metaphors. Question. Um, I would I, metaphor if you want to <laughs> think about you know you can invent any metaphor you want for anything. That's the problem with this stuff. Is that contemporary? You're quite right. How does it make us improve the world to know we shouldn't have seventeen wives or get involved in witchcraft? You know, <laughs> Now, um, and, and can I add to that, by the uh, way? Uh, by the uh, way, I think that it is all very contemporary. I'm just trying to go through it quickly. But I think that, for example, um, the concept of many wives and witchcraft. Okay, so we think, well, we don't have witchcraft today. This is in written 2,000 years ago when there was witchcraft. Okay, so, sorry, Rabbi, we do have witchcraft. witchcraft. We do have witchcraft. I must correct you on that. Uh, I know people, friends of ours, who are active witches. Really? We absolutely have active witchcraft. Um, a few years ago, Jenny and I attended a pagan Wiccan wedding, which was conducted completely in compliance with their witchcraft practices. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I, know that, I know that they do talk about the, is witchcraft still in existence, and they say that, you know, you've got to be careful where you go in Africa because there's certain tribes that still have traditions of witchcraft and people that are still affected by this in places in India. That you have to be careful about. Okay, so whether you're in Australia, that type of stuff or not is, mm -hmm. is is up to discretion. But the point is that even if you're not concerned about witchcraft, by the way, there's a famous story of a guy that there was in India, a Jewish Israeli guy was in India, and he met a woman over there, and they built a relationship, and then he tried to get out of it, and she started playing with his mind in serious ways, even when he was overseas. Um, and I don't know how true the story is, but the guy claims to have become a bad now. Uh, but he, when he saw the Rebbe, um, the Rebbe caused something you know, to happen and it kind of took the spell of him. Um, so there is a guy that walks around with such a story, whether you want to believe it or not, it's your own, own choice. But mm -hmm. I'm saying these things apparently do, do apply. And there's also been other stories of people that have got uh, you know, Israeli backpackers getting uh, spells on them in places in Africa and stuff like that. But, but I don't think that's the main point of, the, of, the, of, of, of what he's trying to say. I think he's sometimes he's trying to say is that you think that you're going to have lots of wives. Okay, today it's not practical because we can't have many wives. But still, people have affairs and they have, a, you know, whatever type of relation, mistresses and other things going on. And he says that ultimately, even if it's not an official wife, any type of outside relationship causes badness to the person, whether it's uh, whether it's legal or not, or considered cheating or an affair, they're not healthy. So it's best to try to find that one person. That's my understanding. And whether it's actual witchcraft or understanding that just because you have um, a different person to have a relationship, it's not necessarily um, going to be fun and games uh, uh, rabbi can i add that like when it mentions about extra wives uh, so in jewish law if a person is alone you know with the opposite gender uh unsupervised that is basically grounds for marriage it's um the, the whole yehud concept so if someone who's already married 
uh, simply is alone with an unmarried female, right? Then um, that could be considered a second marriage. They have responsibility under halakha. Unless their doors open. Yeah, but if the oh, doors well, it's close. Not, it's not, it's, I don't, it's not considered a second marriage. It's considered forbidden. But they care. still have responsibilities. If they do a forbidden act like that, they still have responsibilities to that person or to any offspring. What do you mean to that person? No, not to that person. The offspring, that's different. Offspring, so offspring is offspring. Yeah, he has obligations with offspring, not to that person. Why to that person? If somebody has an affair with a, a single woman while he's married, okay, we're getting into a massive tangent over here, but um, it doesn't make him have any obligations to the woman. He has obligations to the, chi to the child. He doesn't have any obligations as far as I know from a Jewish perspective to the woman. So that wouldn't if, be considered... If a person goes and has a relationship with a single woman, um, it's forbidden. Um, it's definitely not as harsh as if the, were, if the other woman was married. That's really bad from a Jewish perspective. But if it's a single woman, um, it's also forbidden, but not as nearly as severe. Um, but if that person, they then go and have a child together, um, he doesn't have necessarily obligations to that woman at the later stage. He has yeah. obligations to the children. But because the Hebrew word used in the Pukah Vot, uh, it doesn't actually say wife, I don't think. Right, but Noshim, Noshim is wives. Is not it could also is mean woman, but it, exactly, it means, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it, it means Marban Mar Nashim means um, wives over here, it means wives, okay. Okay, let, let's go on a little bit because I see sure. it's already come after one o'clock, and I wanted yep. to get the truth is this mm -hmm. is all the secondary point, really, the second <laughs> half of the mission is in the, yep. the point that we really have to get to. That's the important point, um, because he goes on to say. Um, that so what should we increase in we should overindulge in what increase in Torah study he says that brings life why we said about the Torah ki heim chayenu rameinu. what does it mean it adds life how does something add life to you if you have a lifespan of 70 years how does it going to add life so there's numerous explanations to this but just for simplicity's sake we'll keep it just to, a, to one or two explanations Torah is um, something that when you when you have the pleasure from Torah, it's not something that that's gone the second you've done it. The information a stays with you, the lessons stay with you, and the reward stays with you. On the other hand, physical um, physical uh, pleasures are for the moment that you have them, and then they're more or less gone. Obviously, there's exceptions, but they're more or less gone. So. Torah, the more Torah you study, it increases in your life, actually, and also increases in your afterlife. Increasing study increases wisdom. Okay, that's as, as obvious as it gets. If you want to become wiser, then you have to actually spend time sitting and studying if you want to be wiser. You can't expect to become wiser without actually putting effort in and, and, and studying. Now, when we talked about the next thing that we should have indulged is in counsel. There's two elements to counsel. There's A, receiving counsel, and, and B, giving counsel. And tells us that both things are good, generally. If you're a person that's uh, willing to ask other people when you are in need, having a mentor, that, um, that brings you a great understanding. If you don't have some that you can actually get counsel from, then you'll never have really, it's not just good enough to study, he's saying. You actually have to discuss the studying from somebody else, you have to have a mentor. By the way, that's one of the reasons why um, the explanations to the Torah, known as the oral Torah, were given orally. So that we shouldn't just open the book and study ourselves, but we should actually have a teacher, because if you have a teacher, then there's so much better understanding and clarification, and it's so much more practical. So that's the need for counsel. The second thing is when you um, ask for counsel, ask for help, whether it's in business or wherever your expertise is, wherever you have the ability to help, you should offer to give counsel. When you offer to give counsel, it doesn't only do goodness for the person that you gave the counsel to, it actually helps yourself. When you advise others, it will help you. Like we said in the other the other Mishnah, um, I learn more from uh, 
from everybody else. So teachers that as Jews, we should be asking as many questions as we can, whether it's studying, whether it's in life decisions, we should always be asking and we should also be offering. Um, let's just quickly um, finish off um, the other last points. Now, the next one is increasing charity increases peace. Um, wh why increasing charity adds peace? There's, there's numerous concepts behind this. But the, the, the most basic and fundamental concept about adding in charity is that the world is created purposely unequally. God creates the world unequally. Because if everybody were to be equal and everyone had, let's say, I don't know if you want to call it like uh, communism or to some degree socialism, where everything has sort of equal, um, equal, uh, equal uh, finances or whatever it is, then um, we wouldn't be there, be able to take care of each other. And in every single case, there will always be, it's connected to the previous one, somebody that is wealthy, not just financially, but somebody has more time, somebody has ab ability to have, help somebody in any, every, every area. But if we were just all equally good, besides for being extremely boring, um, we would also be extremely selfish and selfishness is the ultimate cause for um, the opposite and ego is the opposite of peace so if we want to get peace we have to help each other um, and that's why when we see somebody else in need and we give to them it helps us and it helps them there's actually one of the famous commentaries that say that when god created the world he purposely creates it unbalanced some people be wealthy some people should be um, poor and the poor man says to God, you know, God, I can understand. You had to make somebody poor, but why does it have to be me? So now it's causes some of the friction between A, the poor person and God, and between the poor person and the wealthy person. But when the wealthy person goes and helps the poor person or the person in need goes and helps the other person, what they've done is they've created peace between each other and also between the poor man and God. Okay, I thought that was a cute, cute, cute way of understanding it. Um, now, the next one is Connor Shane Toy. If you acquire a good name, you acquire it for yourself. This is the last, uh, second last point. Why is this important? Because um, all the other physical things that we spoke about, like possessions and wives, those acquisitions you think you're getting them, that eventually you die and your possessions, what happens to them? They don't really end up helping you long term unless you make something really good out of them. But if you create a legacy, a good name, that lasts you even after your life. And that is yours to keep. Whether, um, you know, whether you use it, so to speak, or not, it's there. It's there for always. So, so do the right thing to be good to people, acquire a good name. Um, the last point is that if you study Torah, you acquired for yourself um, the, the world to come. Simply what that means saying that when we spend our daily time, our da a, a, a daily uh, set amount of time when we actually study, then every single day, no worries, David, thank you so much. It's basically done, so thank you. Um, have a great Shabbos. Every single day, we have time in the world to come when we will be able to have the benefit of all our Torah study. So we're told that the more study you to do now, the more you're able to do when Mashiach comes, not, uh, when you pass on and when Mashiach comes. So your study level based on where you are after you pass away is relevant, it's equal to where you were in this world. So if you did a lot of study Torah, your level, you continue to study after you pass away, but it, it's, so to speak, on the same level of where you were when you were alive in this world. So you basically delve into what you've studied already. So I don't exactly know what it means. Obviously, we keep on growing even after we pass away. But the fruits and the benefits that we get are mainly based on what we worked on while we were in this world. So that's why it says if you study Torah, you study Torah, gain Torah knowledge, then you create for yourself a place in the world to come because that will go with you and be your life in the world to come. Okay, we'll stop there. Did you mention that you had a, you had a comment in the chat? Um, ah. Why is it the same that wisdom comes from experience, but where does experience come from? Lack of wisdom. 
Yeah, that there's there's also truth in that. It's 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 a, I suppose a different a different element of it. There's a, another saying that goes with it that uh, wise wisdom given to the elderly should be given to the young who desperately need it. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I suppose that's why we have the council. We have to get counsel from the wise and the elderly, so that we can actually. Uh, make use of their wisdom mm. so it's a it's a fascinating uh, you know there's a lot to unpack